Good afternoon, everyone. Did y'all come to hear me or Trey? <laughs> or both? We're going to talk a little bit about integrating UAVs into cotton production and mainly into agriculture. We sit and look about drones. Everybody hears the word drones. I heard that there were a million of those drones sold this year at Christmas. We're talking about how many of y'all own a little bitty one? Anybody? How many own a big one and fly it? So there's a lot of interest out, out in the community looking at using UAVs in agriculture and how we can use them. What I want to kind of do is kind of hit the high points of where we are right now as far as legally being able to fly uh, and, and some of the technologies and some of the different type UAVs and where they have a place and, and where information is really lacking. What's our current environment as far as UAVs? Commercial use is still prohibited. Um, in order for us to fly at the university, we, hate, we fly under a certificate of authorization or a COA. We have one place that uh, we can legally fly in Tennessee and that's our research station at Milan. It took us six, eight months to get that authorization. We're trying to get another authorization. Uh, it's been in FAA's last mailbox for about seven months now and so the time for us to be able to, to legally be able to fly is getting very small. Hopefully by this summer we're going to have regulations out. That's what the FAA has said and kind of hit some of the high points of what those regulations or proposed regulations. <clears throat> You're going to have to always stay in visual line of sight. Daylight operations about like shooting ducks from sunrise to sunset. Uh, maximum altitude, you're going to have to stay below 500 feet. <clears throat> as far as uh, certificates, you're going to have to take a test. Um, and you're going to have to take a recurring test every two years in order to be able to fly commercially. You're going to have to be 17 years old and you're going to have to have some type of certificate or you're going to have to basically register now with the FAA about Six weeks ago they came out and they required anybody that flies, and that includes all of these radio control airplane folks. They're saying now you're going to have to register with the FAA. Right now if you want to do it, it's five bucks. If you wait, that price is going to go up. And you're going to have to have a tail number or some type of a number to be affixed to your UAV. What's that knowledge test going to be? Nobody really knows yet, but I think a lot of it's going to be where you can fly, where you can't fly, how high you can fly, how fast you can fly, what effects weather does, what effects wind. But I think most of it is we start talking about flying around the airspace, and that's class A, B, C, D, E, F. Those are around airports, around helicopter ports for hospitals. You're going to have to learn how to communicate with a, uh, air traffic control. And now for us to be able to legally fly, I have to have a licensed pilot. I have to have a visual observer that's passed the class two physical. You're not going to have to have that. But there's going to be some cases where you're going to have to get in touch with air traffic control and tell them that you're out flying. Again, you're going to have to have a, some type of certificate. You're going to have to have some type of tail number and they're not going to require you to have an airworthiness certificate. So if you want to build one yourself, you can, or if you want to buy one, that's perfectly fine too. So what kind of UAVs are out there? There's two different types. One are the multi-rotors, and you'll see anywhere from three to eight blades. Multi-rotors are, we call them helicopter if you want, but multi-rotors have very good applications and they've got very good uh, ability to maneuver. Well, with a multi-rotor you can go up, you can go down, you can go left, you can go right, you can hover, you can land, start from the ground and go up and you can also come back down and land. So those type of uh, UAVs we're seeing a lot of interest using them for scouting. If you're flying out in the field and you've got a, some type of a video camera, all of y'all have heard the GoPro cameras, you get a live video back to your screen, you're, you're flying, you see something in the field and you go, I need to take a closer look. So now you can drop down to the canopy level, take a look. If you see something, you can mark where you are in the field. You can go back up in the air and take off and, and finish that mission. 
the problems is they're they're not real difficult to fly but it does take uh, a six-year-old boy can probably fly better than most of us because the younger generation is used to video games and if you ever looked at controller it's got two joysticks <clears throat> one gives it you know thrust goes up and down and the other one goes left and right and forward and back and so if you're used to the video controllers they're not that difficult to fly if we talk about fixed wing what's the advantage of fixed wing it gives us more time in the air multi rotors are fairly heavy you're going to hear me say later that battery life is your limiting factor <clears throat> you can only stay up in the air so long uh, a multi rotor with the blades not turning has a glide path of a brick <clears throat> and so it will come straight back down whereas an airplane does it will glide so we you know most systems out there now we're getting 20 to 25 minutes maybe on battery life and then you've got to come down with airplane we can cover more turf you know with our system we can get about 50 acres in a battery life well, with some of these you know the the EBs and some of the other brands that are out there as far as planes we're covering hundreds of acres instead of 50 acres <laughs> they're a little bit more difficult to learn to fly and you got to be able to have a, a place to be able to land them and it's more of a controlled crash landing than it is really a truly landing but the advantage is you're going to be able to cover a lot more turf so if you're a crop consultant and you're trying to cover acres you're probably going to be looking at, at, a, at an airplane if you're looking at doing scouting you're probably going to be looking at a multi-rotor communications I think it's critical if we start talking about doing scouting <laughs> the communications is you're going to have a controller in your hand that's going to fly it and I'm going to tell you a little bit I think it's best if you get one that will fly itself <laughs> but you're also going to need some type of video back feed to your you know to the ground if you're scouting you want to be a bird's eye view of what's going in the field you don't want to have to fly a mission it's you know the GoPro cameras got an SD card so it's recording that mission but you don't want to have to get down to the ground and look at an hour or 30 minutes worth of video you want to be able to see that as that UAV is going across the field and so I think it's critical that if you're thinking about purchasing one be sure to get live video feedback to the ground autopilot uh, <clears throat> our system flies better itself than we can and it's pretty interesting to watch them go up because when you arm that system it pretty much gives you a ground point and then we put in this lawnmower path you see here that's free software mission planner you can download it off the internet you set you know a path you put draw a polygon around the field if you're taking snapshot pictures you tell them how many pictures or how far apart and it pretty much creates that lawnmower path for you <clears throat> with if with a system with autopilot you get it started you hit autopilot it goes up it flies that whole mission and then it comes back and lands itself <clears throat> if you're flying a mission even scouting with a helicopter you can most of the systems now they've got a button you push it pretty much takes it into hover mode you better have your throttle about 50 percent or it will come down <clears throat> but that way you can drop back down to the ground take a look and then hit the button again to go to autopilot and it'll go back up in the air and it'll resume its mission so i think autopilot takes some of the flying out and gives you a little more chance of somebody trying to pay attention maybe to what's coming back from from the camera you're still going to have to have two people probably and when we see what the final FAA rules are going to be one's going to have to always maintain visual sight but somebody's got to be able to look at the video <clears throat> now we talk about cameras everybody's heard about the GoPro camera <clears throat> and, it, and it's high definition what you see from a GoPro camera is just amazing but there's also other cameras out right now I just came back from the Bell White Cotton meeting last week and, and heard about a lot of research that's going on you got multi-spec cameras you got standard red green and blue uh, you got hyperspectral a lot of interest in thermal imaging you can take a thermal image of a field and we start talking about water stress you know I'll show pictures of it a little bit uh, lidar everybody wants to know elevation elevation can give you a different map and all these cameras are doing is just taking an image and we're creating some type of a map 
that hopefully we'll be able to make a management decision off of it. So a directed scouting, here's kind of my, my rule of thumb. If I was going to get one, <laughs> I'd go to a rotary wing. I would go to autopilot. I'd pay the extra money. I'd have a video camera. <clears throat> and again, ability to live stream video back to the ground. You're going to have to have a laptop. <clears throat> and if you're out in the field, you're probably going to have to have some way of being able to, with that mission planner software, it uses Google Earth, Google Map. And so you pull up Google, so you're going to have to have some way of being able to get access to the internet and then you draw your polygon around it and it goes. And the nice thing about Mission Planner is you can actually see where it is in that lawnmower path. So if you're flying over and you see something that doesn't look right, you can look at the computer screen and say, okay, I'm in the third pass over in this part of the field and it's a lot easier to go back to it on foot. And these things will, I don't think, will not replace scouting on the ground. I think you're going to see things that you're going to have to go look at. Hopefully what this will do will make you more efficient as a scout. You'll be able to see areas in the field that you need to spend some time in and there's probably areas in the field that you don't. And hopefully that will make you more efficient and be able to cover a lot more ground in a day by using these for scouting. <clears throat> Again, insects, diseases, weeds, crop progress, a lot of interest from the livestock industry now looking at, at monitoring cattle, monitoring predators. So there's a, just a tremendous amount of uses out there that we think we can use these in agriculture. <laughs> Again, battery life is a limiting factor in this field right here. And it's about a 40 acre field. If we're flying at 16 feet a second, I know I got 18 minutes of flight time. That's about the extent of my battery. Batteries are changing. The battery what we have now is about 20 to 25 minutes. The new one just came out, they're about $500. It's doubled our battery life. But it's also doubled, added weight, and weight is a killer because we've got to be able to stay up in the air and, and weight is a factor. We're carrying a heavy camera, we're carrying a heavy battery. <coughs> if you look at this field right here, I should say, that's a 92 acre field, it's going to take us 42 minutes. So I know if I'm flying with my machine, I've got to come down and change out batteries. If I had a, a fixed wing, I could easily fly this and I'd still have plenty of battery life left. If I'm going to mapping, if you're doing small fields, you probably still may be looking at a multi-rotor, but if you're covering large acreages, you probably want to be looking at a fixed wing. And there's numerous fixed wings out on the market. The price of them uh, can go up tremendously. And again, it's, it's what type cameras are you going to be carrying. A lot of interesting things that I heard down at the Bell Wide looking at things like planning decisions. They're now going up and just using a straight red, green, blue, just a color camera. They're taking an image of the field and they're doing vision processing and they're being able to, to count plants, individual cotton plants that are probably about that tall. And so in, in a, we've all had times when we're sitting there going, <clears throat> should I plant again or should I not plant again? And so if you had an indication of areas in the field that probably don't need to be replanted and areas that do, then you only go to those areas or do you replant the whole field? <clears throat> A lot of things when we have flooding, which we have right now, and somebody told me it's, it's always the second one is worse, and right now it's bad. So you know we've had a lot of wet springs the last few years. We've had a lot of ground that's been underwater that's already been planted. So things like crop insurance and a lot of interest now in, in soil and vegetative moisture monitoring. Is my irrigation system working? Do I need to irrigate? These things are using thermal cameras. So there's a lot of interest and in, in a lot of potential out there. Uh, we're using a multi-spec camera. It, it's basically taking, every time we snap the shutter, we're taking five different wave bands. So we're taking red, green, blue. We're also looking at the infrared and, and this red edge. You can see this red edge is somewhere along in through here. There's been several studies looking at taking this and all we're doing is taking these wave bands and we're creating these vegetative indices that we've been hearing about for years. And whether it's NDVI or NDVI red edge or green, uh, a lot of work's been looking at this dark color index. So all we're doing is taking these pictures and then we're putting them in software packages and we're processing and coming out with a pretty map. Now, what we do with that pretty map 
is where you crop consultants and producers have got to start figuring out with us is how do we use this information. How many of you all remember end time? Came flight out of Mississippi several years ago. They were collecting NDVI. <clears throat> they were using airplanes, right? We've been collecting the same information with satellites for years. <clears throat> Have we figured out everything we need to know about the image? And that's not true. So we've, we've got a ways to go. And I think once the FAA really opens it up and makes it a lot easier for us and you all to be able to fly and take images, I think the amount of information and the information gain will increase dramatically over the next few years. <laughs> you can make nice pretty maps, but you also got to remember that there's things that influence that map. The time of day, what's the sun angle, you're in a big field, you're taking an image, you're in this lawnmower path, and what happens when a cloud comes over? So you got a cloud sitting in a couple of images and then the cloud's gone. And so you've got to think about these images. They're just a, a, an image and a map that we've got to be able to do something with ground truthing, I think, in the future. A lot of interest and in, in a lot of folks now are looking at being able to take those sun angles and sun intensities out and be able to get a good image. But if you take an image of a field today, uh, probably in a week it's going to be different. And a week after that it's going to be different. And it's probably going to be different from the next field over about 50 feet. And so you using one image to do everything is not going to work. We've been looking at nitrogen deficiency and you can see here some of our trials. You know, just looking at straight, you know, normalized vegetative indices. You can see differences. We can also pick up weeds. You fly over a field and you make a decision on whether or not you need to go out and spray. If you got Roundup resistant pigweed, probably by the time you detect it, Jimmy, it's probably too late. Uh, many of, a lot of interest in using multi-spec cameras to be able to, to tell you what, what insect or what disease or what weed is out there. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see in the future of how this progresses. <coughs> A lot of interest again, like I said, in thermal imaging. You can see right here, there's a nozzle clog right here. This is where it's been irrigated and here's where it's not. So that's a nozzle clog. And again, you can see differences, uh, good healthy plants respiring so it's cooler than a stress plant. And so that's how thermal imaging works. Here's where the issue comes in when we start talking about processing this data. How many of you all have done any data processing with images from UAVs? Anybody? Is it easy? <clears throat> there's a challenge to it, and there's a lot of good software out there to help make that challenge go away, but the problem is, is we're taking a lot of images now. We're not talking about kilobytes, we're not talking about megabytes, now we're talking about gigabytes, in some cases terabytes. Anytime we, we flew a 50 acre field and we snapped a shutter, enough to create 590 images that were all three to four megs apiece. And so now we've got a tremendous amount of data that we've got to process. And so you've got to stitch it together, then you've got to ortho rectify it, georeference it, then you've got to process the data, and then you push a button in some of these software, and it generates a map, whether it be NDVI or whatever type map you want to use. Um, but the issue is a tremendous amount of information we've got to be able to manage. <laughs> There's software out there, and I'm not promoting any of these software. You got two options with processing the data. One, you can process it yourself. The two that we've looked at is PIX4D and Agisoft PhotoScan. You can see what the license fee for those are pretty steep. Uh, you better have a good computer. Uh, we, went, we wanted to be able to have uh, the ability to process on the road. So we went out and bought the most powerful laptop that the university would allow us to buy and we throw all those pictures in at night and hopefully when we get up in the morning for breakfast the process is finished. And so again this data processing is a problem. If we talk about moving it to the cloud and there's a lot of companies out there, there's a lot of startup companies that are out there that will actually do the processing for you, you've got to be able to get that image to them. So then the question is, is in rural Tennessee or rural America, how fast can you upload gigabytes of information from your home computer? You know, uploading speed's a lot slower than downloading speed. 
<clears throat> and so there's systems out there now being worked on and tested and there's one in Tennessee where they're taking a picture and sending it to the cloud via cell phone and hopefully by the time you get finished scouting or, or mapping that field then you have an image back <clears throat> but how many of y'all have land that you farm that you can't get a cell phone signal and if you have that then your ability to upload to the cloud is going to be you know more uh, pretty much impossible so in a nutshell <clears throat> if you're going to use one know what you want to do with it because if you're going to scout you might want to go to multi-rotor if you're going to do a lot of mapping probably better off going to a fixed wing <clears throat> then the data processing are you going to do it yourself or are you going to hire somebody <clears throat> what about the agronomic decisions we, we we just came from a precision ag round table and everybody talked about big data and managing big data you know now we're talking about adding to your data and so can we have the ability on the farm to be able to one take that data and make a management decision that will make us money so here's what I think your final three options number one you can buy it you can fly it you can crash it you can process the data and you make the management decisions and, and the one that I put up you can crash it everybody that I've known has crashed <clears throat> It's either operator error or mechanical error, one or two. And in multi-rotor, it does have a glide path of a brick. So you buy it, you fly it, you crash it, you process the data, you make the management decision. Uh, option two, you buy it, you fly it, you crash it, you let a third-party vendor process your data, and then you make the management decision. And the third option is you let somebody else buy it, somebody else fly it, somebody else crash it, somebody else process the data and then you get the map back and then you make the management decision a crop consultant told me one time that these things were a real lot of fun to fly for the first three days and then after that it becomes work <clears throat> and, and so what he said is kind of a true statement I think the ability and the information we can gain from these will help us become more efficient in our farming operations are we there yet? No. Will we get there? I think yes. And I think it's going to really escalate once a lot of folks get out there and start flying and start sharing information. So know what you need, know what you want to do with it before you buy it. And again, if you're going to go and use one for scouting, don't spend a lot of money on it. There's a lot of good units out there that are less than $2,000 that will live stream video back to you and allow you to fly itself. Uh, I think directed scouting is the easiest application. Mapping brings challenges. Um, you got to remember that data in is data out. Good data in is good data out. Bad data in is bad data out. Some of these companies that, that do the processing for you, they have requirements that you need to meet in order to send them that image because they want to be able to send you back the best possible image. And the last thing is, is they're fun to fly, but they're not toys. The one we have it has motors that turn at 10,000 RPM and has 15 inch balsa with fiberglass or I guess basically graphite blades that turn at 10,000 RPM, they're knife blades. So, you know, if you're going to fly them, don't fly them over, folks. <clears throat> we had this past year, I think, our first football game at UT. Some student took one over and flew around Nayland Stadium. <clears throat> Next thing I know, I'm getting emails asking me if I'm the one that was flying over Nayland Stadium. After the fourth email, I finally sent one back and said, let me assure you I have more sense than to fly over Nayland Stadium. <laughs> Questions? Anybody have questions? <laughs> yeah, Jimmy. I think I got one, Mike, that I think would be interested in other producers. It's amazing the potential that this thing has. Got. I mean, you know, it's got irrigation that you did bring up. I'm not being disrespectful to you. But the irrigation, being able to monitor your irrigation, if you've got a bunch of it, for one of these things, it's going to be wonderful when they get it all carefully, completely done like y'all are working. Jimmy's one of our producers in Tennessee. And we have one commercial operation, outside, I think it's a couple now, but one that started up uh, with a bunch of ex-military folks. And they have a 333 exemption, so they can legally fly commercially. 
<laughs> and they've been doing a lot of work on, on Jimmy's place, and, and we got to where we're sharing back information. And, and so I think it, as we get these companies out there and people that are flying and the universities getting more information and we all start sharing, I think the tremendous benefits will come down the road on being able to use these. The nice thing about it, it, it's they're just in time. You know, when do you need an image? You needed it yesterday, right? If we talk about airplanes and satellites, if the satellite flies over and it's cloudy, you don't get an image. If, if an airplane, if the weather's bad and you need an image, you know, with these, with, with the UAVs, it's more of a real-time type image. And I think that's where the true benefit comes from these systems. One other question I'll ask you. Have you noticed it with what y'all are doing? I know we can tell the night of the fish by some of them. Have you noticed where we can tell the B or K? No, we, we haven't got that far, Jimmy. <clears throat> we can see differences, but again, you see differences with anything, but you're going to have to go out and ground truth. It, it will, these maps will not take away ground truthing. You're going to have to go out into the field and be able to say, okay, here's an area that's not like this area. You're going to have to figure out in your own way. Well, it's just going to make you more efficient in work. Any other questions? We appreciate you.